have you all back to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And this is another episode of what probably becomes a volume eight uh, contemplation about courtyards as what could potentially ease at the very least our uh, COVID clause that we're currently in. So this is our disciplinary professional reflection on that one. And we're broadcasting live from three uh, intercontinental locations uh, back to Honolulu, Hawaii, with you, DeSoto. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, everybody. And on the west coast of the continental U.S. in Long Beach, California, Ron Lindgren. Hi, Ron. Hello, everyone. Uh, and we started out with this actually all thinking about sort of making a pool of what we all know about it and what not. And we started out with me thinking, so we started out in Germany and we slowly but surely move over to you to Soto in Hawaii, but we end up making a longer stop, a stop at your uh, home, uh, your selected home, because you're from the prairie, uh, as what's my home away from home in Nebraska, but you decided to be on the West Coast in California. So let's get the first slide up. Um, because I want to chip in that you see at the top right, my dear friend and agent Chris Ford with, uh, out, uh, I wouldn't sit here because he was navigating me through the jungle of the American academe and continues to do so. Um, so one of these years, it was actually when, uh, our president was stopping over and, and trying to uh, meet with Kim Jong-un and that I got so scared that I took a plane to, See him and the gentleman that we see at the end of the show. So we were at one of these Palo Alto um, startup cafes, and we had this very heated discussion about uh, that uh, the iPhone uh, 5 that I was uh, holding on to, and now it's green screen doesn't let me uh, show it to you, and the iPhone number um, 6 was coming out that he just had. So while we have this discussion uh, very heatedly, I, I believe uh, the reason why uh, Apple decided to repurpose the case of the of the five and made it the SE was that someone must have listened to us and said there must be some more old fogies uh, speaking about myself who we can sell uh, the new technology in an old case. So why is that relevant? Sometimes uh, thinking about other things, the architecture makes us understand architecture better. And you see at the bottom that it's no secret that the, up till recently, the chief designer, uh, Joni uh, Ive, has been open about that the German industrial designer, Dieter Rahm, has been inspiration uh, for his product. So uh, in architecture, there were rumors, and they were not uh, confirmed until recently, that actually uh, Steve Jobs uh, grew up in an ICLA house. And the house you see that he grew up in is at the top in the middle. But in fact, that's not an ICLA house as it turned out. But his business partner from the beginning, Steve Bosniak, who you see at the very top in the left, um, has been growing up in one so that's got us think about Eichlers because this show about, is about courtyards and Eichlers were very much about courtyards. So the second slide is when you, DeSoto, and I talked about it. You said, oh, yeah, I have a book about that. And that's the one at the bottom. And I said, I used to have one, too. And that's at the top left. And the two other pictures is Ron Yu because you have been sharing with us Ron, uh, Ed's custom-made home for himself. But in the last show, very excitingly, that as avant-garde modernism, uh, the kind of uh, Americanization of the of the Bauhaus basically made it into mainstream, as with your own home. So that's very interesting. So the Soto uh, and third page up here, please. Uh, that got you so excited that you scanned the heck out of your book. And if we can get the next slide up, Melissa, please. And these are the images you provided. And and tell me about this your selection process. No, no. Well, the pictures that I chose here of the various Eichler homes, I, I chose because they illustrate two very important aspects of these homes. And first of all, they have, <clears throat> excuse me, they have outdoor living spaces surrounded by fences, which make these patios kind of into an extension of the home. But probably even more importantly, 
They include atriums or courtyards, which have four walls around them, but are entirely open to the sky. And as we've been saying, this is something that we want people to be able to use now in the days of COVID, because the more you're outside, the less likely you are to be exposed to and or get sick with COVID-19. So we find in the past some very important lessons for us living today in the year 2020. And for the potential, uh, you know, future under COVID, right? Absolutely. So next slide. Let's look at who that guy was, that Joseph Eichler. And as you can see, he doesn't look like an architect, and he wasn't one. He was actually um, born at the turn of the last century, and age, at age 47, uh, his firm of his mother's family for egg and butter wholesale has uh, stopped business. So he found himself being too early, too young to for retire, and not uh, wealthy enough to retire. So he basically figured out he has to do something else. And the next slide tells us around that time uh, he basically rented. Uh, a house by Frank Lloyd Wright, and the name of that house, I had to look it up, is the Bassett House, and it's one of these Ozonian homes, so the more inclusive word by Frank Lloyd Wright, the house is for the people. And uh, so he lived in there, and he uh, it informed them, and he basically gave him the idea to bring this to the masses, which Frank Lloyd Wright wasn't successful because his his thinking was too flamboyant and too uh, rich in detail, so too complicated and too costly to, to bring to the people. And I have to confess at the very top here uh, and, and, and being informed by that part of Frank Clark Rides um, that I only found out later, and I'm, I, I shared in the past that I'm sort of, you know, I think it's sad that he's remembered by the American public for his most more extravagant uh, flamboyant work as Guggenheim and Falling Water, while the Usonian houses, and particularly what inspired me for the uh, Pacifos Kindergarten for the, uh, uh, the my hometown um, uh, to build the first of the grid kindergarten, uh, our firm looked back into uh, the uh, um, uh, the uh, what's it called the um, the solar hemicycle. The, um, the Jacobs House, too, in Madison, Wisconsin, not that far away from where he grew up on Ron. And, and again, uh, that being said, um, let's go on to the next slide, because um, that's what Eichler then, you know, he said, I, I can't mass produce the Frank Lloyd Wright as much as I, as I love them. I need to strip them more down. And this indeed reminds us of what we've been talking before and what's the foundation of your guys, uh, and, and, and uh, Ron, a legacy of life, very, very kind of uh, lean and mean and, and elegant modernism, right? Yet there are some significant differences. So let's talk about that, guys. Chip in. I'd like to say that uh, this is certainly sort of a penultimate shot of what a, what living in Lakewood House must have been like. There's a birthday party going on. Everybody's got their birthday hats. But notice that although this is definitely a modern mid-century tract home, that these people feel more comfortable living under a sheltering gabled roof or a pitched roof. That sort of uh, preference is because the general public felt, you know, more comfortable with that a home had pitched or gabled roofs. Well, you also pointed out, Ron, that um, it, at the time period that this was going on, there was a prejudice against modern flat-roofed homes to the point where banks, in some cases, wouldn't give people mortgages for homes like that because they were considered to be not as saleable as more traditional-looking houses. Indeed. Uh, despite that, uh, let's go to the next slide. The Eichler houses decided to dwell on what we're focusing on in the comprised eventually probably of eight volumes uh, uh, shows here, the courtyard. And you guys had some uh, humorous observations of what we're seeing <laughs> here, Ryan. Yeah. Ron, what do you think? Yeah, I, I love this shot. Uh, apparently at-home parties in the 1950s and 60s apparently meant that the men wore suits and ties and the women brought out their most stylish cocktail dresses. And this is California, by the way. 
Yeah, and I pointed out when we discussed this earlier that this is a publicity picture. This is not reality. And publicity pictures are very carefully set up to sell something. And the models have all been placed very carefully, the lighting, et cetera. So this is not reality. And so, no, people in Eichler homes probably were not having parties that looked like this, even in their <laughs> courtyards, as wonderful as their courtyards were. <laughs> So I think we're on to something really interesting here. Um, they, they have been staged now, grantedly, uh, the most famous uh, portrait case study house, Clear Clinics, case study house 22, also is very staged, you know, the women in their skirts there, oh, yeah. riding, oh, and yeah. this woman was talking about that. But we're getting to something here that's something really nerdy, admittedly, here, because we're talking about the fine grain between the different movements in modernism, uh, where Eichler like went a little bit more traditional, as you were pointing out, uh, Ron, and then obviously uh, your your former boss and business partner at Killingsworth, having been more on the on the hardcore side of the ultra modernist with these scandalous uh, flat roofs that were connotated with uh, with socialism. Let's go to the next slide. That all being said, under that umbrella. You have some very interesting uh, um, um, project here to share. Please kick in. What is that, Ron? Yeah, uh, Ed also, besides the, the buildings he's more famous for, especially the case study houses, also took his hand at traditional homes. But what I didn't know, in fact, uh, I had no idea that Ed had designed a small gable-roofed home in a similar style and a residential scale of sort of a typical Eichler house until he pointed it out to me while we were taking a drive together through our shared neighborhood of Bix Bixby Knowles, which is in North Long Beach. The house itself is sort of a mystery to me as that I haven't been able to determine ownership in the exact year that it was built during the 1960s. But I'd, I'd like to show how Ed took some of the Eichler uh, attitudes towards uh, modern living, and put his spin on it. Now, this photograph shows that he had always designed gardens to accompany his homes. So he pro produced his own landscape drawings that were included in the building documents. And he was a very savvy plantsman. He knew what grew. And I think this photograph of this very handsome tree and the succulent sort of attest to that skill. And these houses would not be what they are without their uh, placement among uh, landscaping designed to go with it. And if you look at the next slide, he, uh, at, the, at the very front, wanted to be very public. And so he produced uh, and asked the owner to develop and maintain a very large rose garden that you see at the right. But at the left, you see some bollards and some lights, which actually stand as sentinels to the entry drive into the motor court. And here again is Ed being both modern, if you look at, at that, uh, those bollards, but at the same time, they have a very uh, traditional touch. Now let's take a look at the house itself with the next slide, please. At the right of, this, uh, of these pictures, light, uh, right lower, you can see the home's uh, sloping gabled roof, very low sloping, very thin uh, uh, roof. But at the left, you see a pair of steel and translucent glass doors, which open not into the house, but into an outdoor entry court at the front of the house. And uh, Ed designed this, uh, these, this pair of doors, and their very delicate appearance and the fine proportions of this doorway uh, are hallmarks of, of the kind of details he would have with the home. But this is very much an Eichler sort of home. And in the next slide, we see that those memorable doors are a portion of the entry court's glass privacy wall. And even the elegant drought-resistant plants and their architectonic pots are basically uh, today's knockoffs of what were Ed's original selections back in the 60s. And finally, if you go to this, this uh, last, the next slide, we're sort of seeing the house in its neighborhood. The garden entry court off the street is revealed as being for both automobiles and pedestrians. The garage forms one side of the sweeping courtyard, while there is, as you can see, a rectilinear topiary hedge that forms the others. 
Now, the current owners didn't allow me to take photos in their home, but I do know that the Florida sloping ceiling glass walls provide exquisite and broad views of the beautifully maintained fairways of a private country club's 18-hole golf course. And frankly, as I looked at these photos that I took recently, the house, now, now I think it's more of a Cliff May sort of home. Uh, Cliff May, an architect, also did many uh, tract houses in California. And uh, DeSoto, you seem to have a family relationship with an author that uh, had done a book about Cliff May. Exactly. The, the book that's illustrated in the upper right corner, which is called Cliff May, the Modern Ranch House, is written by my cousin's husband, Daniel Gregory. And my cousin is Mary Gregory. And he grew up, Daniel grew up in a house that was one of Cliff May's early designs. So that inspired him to want to write about him. And we're seeing that both Cliff May and Joseph Eichler are important figures in this post-war period of tract housing and that type of thing that was going on very much in California after World War II. And Ron, uh, thanks a lot for shedding a light on this you know, the exquisite, I guess, uh, exception to the rule of, which gets us to the next slide, of um, Ed having been choosing to be on that scandalous, uh, you know, flat roof socialist yeah. uh, group associated. And the picture you provided at the bottom right of the triad houses from the aerial view really shows that again. And then there is um, uh, uh, Richard Neutra um, um, project at the top of that. We're also zooming into the T-shirt again that you provided to us that puts all these modern masters together. And they actually have placed, probably very wisely, as next to Richard Neutra, right? So they were one gang. And can you please recall, because I think Frank Wright was on there too, but can you please quickly share um, how big that discrepancy was between these groups, and particularly Wright and Neutra, please, Ron? Yeah, uh, although it's hard to believe, uh, we, know, we all know that Frank Lloyd Wright's career was extremely long. And he actually hit some fallow periods where he wasn't doing so well. And in fact, when uh, Richard Neutra, uh, uh, immigrating to the United States and then to California, became very popular and ended up in magazines, books, and whatever, Wright, who at that time was drowning in debt and didn't have much work, was really jealous of Neutra. And his jealousy came out uh, in comments that he would make about Neutra. It's funny, this seems like a very strange sort of curse. Uh, but listen to this. Wright, uh, Wright called Neutra a Johnny jump up in a bed of pansy. Yeah, which is there's a there's a oh, lot wow. of there's a lot of baggage in that statement which we don't have time to get into. <laughs> yes, right. what a nice guy history tells us anyway as much Frank Light Ride have been right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So uh so that being said, she she had this ultra modern sort of post Bauhausian group with Ed and Neutra and Schindler and Gropius. And then you had, at the very bottom left, you had the general public that was rather clueless and looked more for traditional, probably where they came from, the Victorian or the Tudor. And then as we've been keeping thinking about it, at the top right, this illustration of the ranch house might have been the compromise, right, yes. between yeah. the two. It was, it was, as you said, the sort of, it was modern but as you say, Ron, it was also traditional that it was picking up on some kind of heritage of the, the kind of the Spanish colonial, right, and the, the more agricultural court yard, right? Yeah, this is where uh, Cliff May differed from Eichler in the sense that they were – this is obviously a one, a one-off home. But even some of May's uh, tract homes tended to sprawl a bit more, and they also harkened back – more uh, literally to historical uh, past architecture, especially Spanish American ranchos. And some people are just comfortable with that feeling of their ties with the past under a rancho roof. Yeah. yeah. Right. And go to the next slide. We see now the ranch house is, is history itself. And there's this magazine called Atomic Ranch that we show a cover on the top right. And that issue is about Eichlerhound. So they were seeing Eichler as being one of their 
members, so to speak. And the two shows we quote at the bottom right is uh, it didn't go as far as we said in the 60s, the German president uh, lived in a flat roof bungalow with a courtyard. And in America, even the pretty reactionary uh, Ronald Reagan lived in a ranch house. So I guess no surprise that on the left, that Julius Schulman picture um, was depicting, you know, that kind of compromise of American modern, you know, um, um, proletarian living. And you guys got a kick out of the out of the image and want to share your thoughts and your knowledge from the behind the scenes, having worked with Julius, Ron, right? Well, I was going to say that this is very much, like I mentioned earlier, a publicity picture, and it's idealizing the modern tract home with mother pushing the lawnmower on the left and junior and his bicycle in the driveway. But it's also just a place you. It's got this branch of a an orange tree with orange fruit on it hanging so beautifully above them. And we all agree that uh, we're sure that that was a branch that somebody cut off of a real tree and hung up or held so that it was in just the right position to suggest that there was an orange tree growing on this property. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd like to mention that this staging is really trying to, to sell the fact that Eichler was talking about carefree, informal living. And how much more informal could you be than uh, the woman outside in her shorts mowing the lawn? Uh, when I see uh, on the right, the electric pole sticking up in the background, of course, I, I would have photoshopped that out of the picture, but that wasn't possible back then. No, it wasn't Julius. possible then, no. <laughs> we didn't have those electronic tools. Exactly. Well, let's slowly but surely go back home to Hawaii, which is home for all of us in different ways. And so get, let's go to the next slide, because we were thinking with the bottom part that you guys talk about more elaboratively, but the, the bottom part of the top left, bottom left picture, a Jeep, reminded us of what Eichler was for California, probably the closest to that in Hawaii was Henry J. Kaiser, who with Hawaii Kai was also initially trying to develop, um, you know, a, a, a larger subdivision for the people. And in fact, uh, our show with Rick Prala demonstrates that he was rather successful in, in doing that. But you guys, please elaborate more on the on the rock Rapson case study house that we see at the at the bottom in the couple of pictures. Well, I just wanted to say quickly that the, the picture on the lower left was a really iconic image in the United States after World War II, and this was the first case study house from 1945, and it never got built. It never went beyond until, as Ron will tell us later on, but. The addition of it, two things are going on here that are interesting. To designate it this, to really make it clear that this is the end of World War II, there's a Jeep in the driveway of this fantasy house, meaning the war has ended and Jeeps are now available for the public. But overhead is this little personal helicopter. And that was a fantasy of that post-war period, too, that everybody was going to have their own personal aircraft to commute in, which uh, did not ever happen. But, Ron, tell us about this house that you've actually seen in person. Yes. Uh, I was so surprised to find this very uh, – one of my favorite homes in the Case Study House program from 1945, the very year that the program uh, came into existence. And when you look at these drawings, uh, one, comment, one comment I've always had about architecture is that there isn't all that much humor in it. Ralph Rapson – was a funny guy, and how his sense of humor came through in his drawings. But more seriously, uh, this unbuilt, innovative design was among the most unconventional of all the entire case study houses. It was an open, pavilion-like structure, and it was bisected completely by an interior courtyard, which he called a green belt. And that planting separated the communal spaces of the house from the bedrooms. That courtyard bisected the house completely, and it was 12 feet wide and covered in glass. There were three bedrooms on one side, uh, living, kitchen, and dining rooms on the other. And, in fact, the community space was expanded because you could open folding doors on the bedrooms to open the bedrooms completely open to the courtyard itself. And 
The architect said of his plan, for once, the complete integration of inside and outside will have been accomplished. The idea of encompassing nature directly within the house, Rapson felt, demonstrated an original solution for the problem of a confined urban site. The a picture of the, of the sketch of Rapson's at the lower right shows that the court might be an ornamental or a vegetable garden, or at the uh, upper right, a closely monitored children's playground, as the sketches show. Again, Ralph, Raps, Raps's, uh humor comes in because the child apparently has stubbed a toe or something, but it's falling there while Mom looks out. But look closer at the drawing on the left. This is one of Raps's most playful drawings. Uh, you can see a woman hanging out her washing to dry on a clothesline in an outdoor service yard. And such yards were uh, an absolute home necessity in the pre-war. Rapson got it wrong, though. The real post-war revolution in domestic living wasn't skies full of personal helicopters or flying cars, but the availability of residential electric washers and dryers, yes. which completely eliminated the need for service yards. Right. Right. Absolutely. And we need to uh, wrap up and go to the next slide, really a quick second to last one. Has this happened in Hawaii? Not uh, besides some little enclaves here and there of modern uh, style, one in the foothills of your hood, uh, DeSoto, where we had a Christmas party in an octopus house that had a courtyard, but not to the scale that, that I glad. We're talking 11,000 houses. We're talking entire subdivisions designed by Eichler. This is us using the original Hawaii 5 episodes as research materials. There's one of the early episodes that depicts on that sort of challenge of developing out there, uh, and it actually says at the bottom, affordable housing, but it, it never happened to a degree uh, we've now looked at it with Eichler, and that's, you know, it is what it is. And so with that, it should happen in the future. Uh, next slide and last slide is to phase out. Here is uh, another interesting parallel between Eichler and, and your friend and boss and partner uh, at Peelings with Ron is that they both in, uh, also um, experimented in residential high-rise. Um, you pointing out in the show all the proposed projects and then in a couple of volumes uh, about the only one executed, which is our Albert Square in Honolulu. And what we see on the top left is when at my escape, Trump escape trip with our, uh, I had uh, our friend uh, Kurt Stanburn take us around and he told, took me up to Russian Hill where that is to this project that's called the Summit, and that is an Eichler high-rise development that unfortunately as business-wise broke his neck and, and make him run bankrupt, so then only go a little bit back to a single family uh, development after that uh, be, before he died. But both having been trying to basically bring their idea to the multi-story elevation, and this is an equally nice find, what our friend Kurt calls stack lanai's, right? Floor-to-ceiling glass, you know, lanai's wrapped all around it. Uh, so another interesting um, uh, sort of parallel between two people. And on that last note, before we have to phase out talking parallels, one of the designers, architects that I could choose to work with him was at best friend. And who was that on a closing note, Ron? Yeah, A. Quincy Jones, a wonderful architect, wonderful educator. Uh, he and Ed got to know each other because of their uh, connections at the University of Southern California. And uh, A. Quincy Jones designed some Ehrlich homes. Uh, and uh, Ed and Quincy became very good friends. In fact, I would say uh, that A. Quincy Jones was Ed's uh, favorite architect. All right. And on that note, we're out of time. So, dear friends, uh, look forward to see you soon again uh, in the remaining volumes of this episode and in more to come. So, and until then, you and everyone else, please stay safe and sound through Easy Breezy and Easy Breezy Faces and Places. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.